Hello, everyone. Welcome to Be Based Wise. Uh, today, we're going to talk about. Uh, I mean, <laughs> welcome to this particular uh, broadcast, this particular webinar, where we're going to talk about recycling incentives in lower income communities. And we have Zoe, Zoe from Waste Aid, who's going to be moderating this webinar. Zoe has uh, been associated with Be Waste Wise for quite a bit. She's been a panelist, she's also moderated webinars in the past. She's the head of programs and engagements for Waste Aid UK. And uh, she has put together a panel which is from all over the world, in short. So we have uh, Mazin Mukhtar, who's currently in India, and he's a co-founder of Akshar Foundation. We have Victor Ramusa, who is from Nigeria. He's a founder of Waste Bazaar Limited. And we have Hilda, who's a co-founder of FEFA Recycling. You're not able to see her because uh, there's a bit of a network issue. And uh, I mean, it might just be better to listen to her than try and connect the video and the audio. Anyway, so before I hand it over to Zoe, now uh, just a quick reminder, the panel will be taking questions as and when they come up. So please do not wait until the last minute. Please feel free to use the Q&A section, share your questions. Uh, if you're going to wait till the end, we just have an hour. So we may not really get the time to get your question answered. So uh, that's about it. I'm going to hand this to Zoe and uh, yeah, go ahead, Zoe. All right, thank you ever so much for the uh, the introduction, Esveta. Um, hello, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be uh, joining these Be Waste Wise webinars. Um, as Sveta said, I've been involved in them for quite a few years now, so um, and it's, it's always a pleasure. Um, so this time round, I was invited to come up with a with a with a webinar topic, and what I thought was that um, because we've, we're seeing more and more around the world the need to collect materials, whether it's for recycling or just as a as a straightforward waste collection system. Um, and there's different ways to engage with, with the community about how, you know, with how to boost the amount of material that you can collect. So what I did was I went online and had a little look around, um, asked some of, my, some of my contacts and networks, put it out on LinkedIn. And I'm delighted to say that we've got three amazing uh, participants joining us today. So as Sweta said, um, we have Mazin Mukhtar from the Akshar Foundation in India, which is a school where um, school children are invited to bring plastics to school to pay for their school fees. Um, then we have Victor Amusa, who is a, an entrepreneur who set up Waste Bazaar Incentive Scheme, which is an app where um, you know, people can uh, log on, get their materials collected in return for cash or credits. And finally, we have um, Hilda Adda from CESA in Ghana, um, where they are collecting plastics, aluminium and other valuable wastes um, through an incentive based system. So I hope you've all got your questions ready. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite um, each of our panelists to introduce themselves first. And then I have a list of questions for us to work through. Um, hopefully it's going to cover most of the areas um, that you're all interested in hearing about. But as Sweta said, please do send in your questions and we'll try to get as many answered as we can. So without further ado, I'm going to pass to our first panelist, Mazin Mukhtar um, from the Akshar Foundation in India. Um, Mazin, would you please introduce yourself and explain a little bit to us and to our listeners about, um, about your incentive scheme that you run at your school in India? Thank you. Sure, thanks so much for having us here. Uh, so we have a model school. Oh, uh, my name is Mazin Mukhtar. I'm uh, originally from the US and I moved to India about five years ago and started Akshar Foundation with my wife. Uh, wasn't my wife at the time, we became, we got married later. But um, we started this school. The idea is to develop a model that we can replicate in government schools. Uh, and part of that model is we want every school to become a waste collection center and a waste processing center, mostly for plastic, clean, dry plastic waste, which is kind of a menace in India. Uh, so we started a, a recycling center in the school that would employ the teenagers uh, after school. So our main goal actually with the school is to employ former child laborers, get them back into school and they can earn some money doing community development work um, after school. And they earn money by teaching younger kids during the school day. 
So we started this, uh, this recycling center in the school and uh, these, you know, dropouts, former dropouts, child laborers would work after school and uh, process the plastic into eco bricks. We make, uh, we compress plastic packets, mostly non-recyclable plastic into uh, PET bottles. And uh, one little 500 ml bottle can hold uh, up to 40 little packets of plastic because uh, plastic's mostly air, it's mostly surface area. So when you can uh, compress it, it, uh, it, it takes away a lot of its, uh, its uh, damaging power. It doesn't fill up with water, it doesn't you know, cover all the waterways, which we see here, and uh, clog up drains and lakes and things like that. Uh, <laughs> So we started employing these child laborers after school um, to, uh, to process the plastic. And they would also go out and collect plastic from the community. Uh, once we had that going, we started asking all the parents of our students uh, to start sending plastic uh, to school, their household plastic. Uh, and they didn't, they didn't care. Uh, it's much easier for them to, they mostly discard the plastic wherever, wherever they're standing. They sweep up all the plastic waste from in front of their house at the end of the day and um, uh, set it on fire mostly is, is the easiest way to dispose of it. Uh, so when they refused to send their plastic to school, we told them, okay, sure, until now the school's been free, but now you're gonna start paying fees of plastic waste. Uh, so if you don't send your plastic to school, you can pay your fees in cash. Uh, and that was, you know, enough. Uh, nobody wants to pay cash. They sent all their plastic. Every week we have steady, uh, a steady supply of plastic. Almost too much to cope with now. Uh, and now our focus is on spreading this model to government schools and, uh, and, and getting more schools to, to adopt this, uh, this model. Uh, we're also building uh, machines to shred the plastic and uh, make uh, useful new uh, materials out of it, like uh, kitchenware or um, even building materials like posts and uh, big sheets that can be used as roofing. Uh, so we can take all the single-use plastic and make uh, you know, long-lasting building materials out of it. That's great. Okay, thank you so much, Martin. That was a that was a brilliant introduction. Really interesting. I learned a lot there that I hadn't realised about your your program as well. Actually, um, nice that. Well, I I didn't realise that um you had no fees at your school, and it was purely a way to bring to get people to bring their plastic in actually rather than setting up an alternative to to an existing scheme. So, really interesting. Thank you. Um. We're going to come back and explore your, uh, you know, your your program a little bit more. I just want to uh, introduce the other two speakers, and then we've got the full contrast for people to uh, to, to see, you know, the, the different options that they could implement themselves. So next up, I'm going to ask Victor. Um, hi, Victor, are you there? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Would you like to? Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your incentive scheme, please? Okay, thank you, Zoe. Hello, Thanks. everyone. Uh, my name is Amosa Temitokwe Victor, and I have about five years' experience now in incentive motivated waste recycling. Uh, my backgrounds are actually in chemistry and the sciences, and I got a certificate in sustainable waste management as well. Um, I've been involved in initiatives around the environment, youth entrepreneurship, and women empowerment. Uh, for these, I've attended quite a couple of international and national fellowships. For close to a decade, I've worked on polymer conversion industry, uh, especially polymer conversion, plastic conversion techniques. And I started up Vicfold Recyclers, which is actually a community recycling engagement initiative that pioneers community recycling programs and convert polymer waste to resin pellets in North Central Nigeria. So while working on scaling impact, I created the Waste Bazaar app for wider reach and digitized incentives to make waste recycling habitual among residents of developing nations. And likewise, tackle the huge waste management crisis that is confronting urban and peri-urban areas of Nigeria and other developing nations. So what we simply did was to use geofencing and system support functionalities 
to provide real-time access to convenient and affordable waste collection service. Just like you have the Uber hub, we have a waste disposal or waste collection hub in Waste Bazaar that allows you also to connect to the nearest recycling station where recyclable waste is exchanged for green credits, which can also be converted to local currency for day-to-day -day transactions like bill payment, purchase of grocery, shopping, to even cash rewards. Now, how it works simply is just to download the app. Uh, it serves both urban and peri-urban areas in Nigeria. It has also been tested also in Egypt, in Cairo. And the way it works is simply to download the app, get registered, and then you immediately start using the feature. You get to locate recycling stand centers that are being driven by youths in local communities. And at the same time, you also get to connect with general waste collectors. I, I must say that we are the first clean tech company in Nigeria, and indeed Sub-Saharan Africa, that has built an inclusive solution for both recyclable and non-recyclable waste stream which means that we don't only deal with the recyclable waste alone, we also build a business model around the non-recyclables and general organic waste. That is what we do at Waste Bazaar. Thank you so much, Amusa. That sounds really interesting. And um, I was particularly um, uh, interested at the end there where you pointed out that it's not just the valuable recyclable materials that you collect because I can see that that would be the temptation for some schemes like yours uh, where you obviously have quite a lot of uh, costs in terms of your collection scheme. Um, so great to see that you're also dealing with the, the non-recyclable elements there as well. I think um, from a waste aid perspective obviously we're waste managers first um, and so we, you know, our priority is public health and clearing the streets of, of anything that might uh, might contribute to the spread of disease and so on. So that's always a priority for us. Um, although, you know, obviously it's, it's easier to deal with recovering value from, from more valuable materials. So yeah, good, uh, good introduction. Thanks for that. I think it's going to uh, raise quite a few questions from our audience. Um, we've already had a couple of questions come in uh, for Mazin, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip over to Hilda next um, so that Hilda can give us an introduction to her program in Ghana. Um, and then after that, we'll start, uh, we'll start working through the questions. So Hilda, are you there? Can you unmute yourself, Hilda? Yes. Yeah. Hi, yes. thanks so much. So please give an introduction Hello, to your, can you to your hear program. Me? Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. can hear you loud and clear. Hello. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be part of this initiative. Uh, my name, as you've, you've mentioned, is Hilda Ada. Um, I'm a social development uh, practitioner. I've been working with uh, communities and children for the past um, decade and a half. Um, I, I am involved in uh, all kinds of social change and empowerment, especially in deprived communities. Um, I, work, I work in schools to improve um, sanitation and hygiene behavior change and uh, working in mostly basic public schools uh, with children between the ages of um, four and 15. Um, three years ago, I joined an initiative called um, Asasa Foundation. Um, their priority is to set up waste recycling plants, plastic waste recycling plants in communities. Um, ours is to empower, Asasa Foundation is to empower women because women are really the image or the face of uh, waste pickers. So to empower these women through all kinds of incentives and also uh, to increase the volume of collection of uh, plastic waste. A year ago or eight months ago, we piloted a project uh, called CESA, which you know, uh, to increase this volume collection of plastics in our communities. What we do is we, we've targeted in the community, we've targeted uh, schools, that is institutions, 
we target marketplaces, we target um, lorry parks, churches, if you know Ghana very well. We are very religious people. So every, everybody goes to church or the mosque. So if we can't get them at home, you would definitely get them in church or the mosque. So we collect the, uh, the recyclables in these avenues. Um, our biggest win, I think, is in the schools. Our main objective of especially engaging schools is uh, one, behavior change, start the practice of uh, waste management through segregation um, with children. So we hope in the next 10, 15 years, we'll have a generation that is more uh, conscious of um, waste um, sorting and segregation. And then two, to of course deal with the issue at stake the waste phenomenon so collect as much um, waste in the system especially recyclables and to add to that to um, engage people to know that waste is not waste waste is wealth it depends on how you manage it and so with these three we hope that we'll be able to tackle the menace of uh, uh, waste, especially plastic, because that is what is not uh, uh, degradable. So to deal with that and also to start uh, educating people who would eventually exhibit a new behavior in the near future. So basically, that is what I would say about ourselves. And as we go along, we will talk more about as I say, and uh, CISA recycling. That's super. Thank you so much, Hilda. Again, really interesting. Um, I was, I, I like how you're engaging people through different avenues within your community. So um, whether they go to church or the mosque or if they're younger to catch them in school. Um, so there's, there's going to be some interesting parallels between your program and Mazian's as well, by the sound of it. So looking forward to exploring those shortly as we move on through the conversation. Um, what I'm going to do before I move on to the questions that, um, that we've prepared for our discussion, I'm going to just very briefly address some of the questions that have come in already from our from um, people all over, all over the world. So, um, Mazin, a couple of questions for you, first of all, please, about the, um, you said that you were turning some of your plastic into plastic sheets. Um, so could you please tell us what kind of technology you're using to do that? Are you using an extruder or some other um, electron, electric technology? No, we haven't done that yet. We are uh, adapting the system of um, uh, an NGO called Precious Plastics, yeah. Um, with uh, this guy named Dave Dave Hawkins, Hawkin, mm -hmm. uh, we met him in Korea actually at a conference, and we saw his uh, his machine. Uh, now mm -hmm. we have a team that's just ordering the the hardware, but um, uh, it's uh, a shredder, I believe. There's an extruder for making um, bowls and um, uh, you know uh, surface uh, like uh, tools for for uh, waste baskets, things like that. And that yeah. uh, uses like filaments of um, of uh, shredded uh, shredded and melted plastic, and mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't started all this yet. Now all we're doing is eco bricks, which is sure. all very low tech, uh, yeah. you know, uh, labor intensive, and we use that Stuffing with the plastic into a bottle. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But um, cool. I okay. think, uh, and they've just figured out how to. Um, uh, the precious plastics people how to make um a sheet press so yeah it, it is like a okay. like a, a hot yeah. press that they sure. uh, that they use to produce these uh, mm -hmm. sheets and even plastic yeah. beams so that's what yeah. we're trying okay. to do now uh, we're also looking to possibly partner with cement factories um, uh -huh. that have uh, high temperature incineration if the the amount of plastic that's coming in is too much for us to uh, to sort and recycle or upcycle uh, yeah then the next best option is for it to be uh, sure. incinerated at over 1500 degrees uh, mm -hmm. instead of you know families huddling around uh, the, the yeah. burning plastic. Exactly, okay, thanks. No, that's great, that's really helpful. Um, so thanks to uh, Daniel Dijana and Enzo Favorino. Um, hi guys, thanks for your questions. Um, we've got a quick question coming for uh, Victor Amusa about your Waste Bazaar app. Please could you tell us 
how people can find the app online. Um, a couple of people have looked at it. So Linda Godfrey in South Africa and Nina um, from the International Waste Platform in Indonesia, they've both asked actually for more information. How can we find that, please? Okay, well, it's currently available on the Android platform. So you could just do a search on Play Store, the Waste Bazaar Waste, together with B A Z double A R. And then mm -hmm. you have the app readily there for you to download for free. The very mm -hmm. interesting thing is that it's highly scalable because it only involves us getting local, passionate, young entrepreneurs in some of these countries faced with um, waste management crisis. And then you, it's a plug-in because it's easy to get young people to earn revenue and income while at the same time getting the environment cleaner. So currently, mm -hmm. if you download it and you have it registered, you won't be able to see locations in your country because you have not created one. But once a drop-off center is created in your country, you easily see it on the map and you are easily directed to drop off your recyclable waste. Not only that, once we're also in partnership with waste, general waste collectors and others in your country, you immediately get also connected to them as per the closeness of where you stay to the service of waste collection. So it mm. is a plug and play. It can run anywhere. Like I mentioned earlier, we did it in Egypt. It ran well. So just do a search on Play Store, Waste Bazaar, and then you have it there for download. Brilliant, thank you. And um, just so everyone listening, I would recommend that you have a look because I had a I had a quick look around the app and it was it looked really professional, really nicely produced, um, good example for people to take a look at. And um, I recommend it. So great, thank you for that. Um, one question I think that all of you um, that's relevant to all of these um, schemes. So I'm going to start with Hilda, perhaps. And we could ask, um, how do you, how are you financially, you know, um, what's the word? Like, how are you covering your financial costs of your of your collection system? Are you getting funding from companies outside? Is it from the government? Uh, you know, what's how, how are you doing it? Hi, Hilda. The initial um, um, uh, project, hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes, so the initiation funding came from donors. So we had donor support for our, um, what I would call pilot to scale. And, uh, but we have always wanted to be um, self-sustaining. Um, our program is social but um, we have social enterprises which uh, aim to make profit, to uh, reinvest into the scheme, to pay our overhead costs, and to invest into future projects. So our aim is to be self-sustaining from day one. Um, what we do is that we, the waste that is collected is sold. So we sell to off-takers, and the money goes back to payments. Uh, we, reward, we have a reward systems for the different categories that we deal with. For schools, um, most of the schools we deal with are public schools. Their biggest challenge is um, sanitation, maintenance, operations and maintenance. So we, uh, part of the money is used to uh, offset the um, the bills or the payment of um, uh, soaps and other detergents for cleaning. Um, we also have a scheme to, to pay the water bills and uh, electricity bills. So the payment goes straight to the utility billing system to offset it. And um, for there are some group of people, uh, groups who want cash. I told you that we are dealing with um, deprived communities. All these deprived communities, and especially uh, women, the underserved women, they need their money ASAP. So cash at hand, business going. <laughs> so um, yes, we, we, we pay them off, but the waste that we collect is sold to off-takers. Our off-takers include Asasa Foundation, which I am involved. We buy the, the waste, 
we, we reprocess it and then sell to other applications that um, we say like um, closes the loop. So for example, we don't want the plastic to go back into the environment. It has to be used to produce useful products like um, pavement blocks, um, uh, bowls, chairs, uh, building sheets, you name it. So definitely we sell what we get and then we plow it back. We use it to pay our workers, we use it to pay the cost of collection and everything. Wow, but so, so just to I clarify have, then, sorry, you're just collecting plastic and that's enough money to give everybody that provides you with plastic some financial incentive plus pay for your salaries plus pay for the transport for all of that just from the value of the plastic that you're collecting yes um so yeah so this is what we are doing but you see we are if if you know waste management waste management cannot be um the private entrepreneur's burden it's a burden of the public which includes both uh, governments, local government, national government, the communities themselves, and the private enterprises. Mm -hmm. um, in our operations so far, we haven't seen a lot of government interventions in terms of subsidy. We cannot um, um, operate effective waste management system without subsidy. So um, even though we are doing our best to uh, break even and um, uh, invest in future operations, we would always need a subsidy to ensure sustainability, especially of the collection, behavior change, and other processes along the value chain. Okay, thank you. That's a very comprehensive answer. Thanks, Hilda. That's helpful. So I'm going to move across to Mazin now then. Um, just one quick one, um, Mazin. People were asking whereabouts in India you are. Now, I know it's Assam, but if, you'd, if you could just tell us exactly where you are, first of all, and then maybe tell us a little bit about how you are funding um, you know, your programme. Is it purely through the sale of the materials that you're collecting or do you have outside subsidies? Thanks. Sure. Uh, so our school is, our model school is in Assam, which is in northeast India, uh, up near Tibet and Myanmar, and uh, it's, it's pretty remote from uh, the, the rest of India. Uh, but now we're trying to implement this model in uh, a government school in Delhi uh, and uh, near Mumbai and then Maharashtra in the, in the next uh, few months, hopefully. Uh, but uh, so... Now we rely on donations from uh, foundations. Uh, we're also using, um, uh, so we get a, a, a donation for plastic recycling, for example, uh, and then we, we collect a, a ton of plastic, make bricks, and make, uh, build some kind of uh, uh, small construction project. And then uh, our plan is to put a little plaque or something on these uh, on these projects that said that this is donated or supported by XYZ business, and uh, that that can be one way to make it um, to you know generate some some more support. Uh, we also are trying to sell the plastic to uh, cement factories, but we only want to do that with the excess that we can't uh, you know build up into uh, something. Um, we're looking into road construction also, um, but really the way to, the, the only way forward is, as Hilda said, is, uh, some public support, uh, and the government's the only, you know, entity in place that can do this kind of large scale, uh, uh, innovation. So we're approaching government officials. We're telling them, look, we're going to help you transform, uh, schools into plastic collection centers where children can learn how to, uh, uh, make something productive out of plastic. They learn about the environment. They learn responsibility. They learn. We combine all their biology lessons, their science lessons, ecology lessons into that. So we take this uh, terrible social problem and and we can turn it into a valuable uh, learning experience for the children. Uh, and if governments adopt that model, um, government schools are free. I saw one question asking um, if uh, if government schools uh, pay school fees they do not but we're trying to get them to adopt the same policy of plastic school fees so that there's some kind of accountability 
responsibility that's uh, being imparted to the people. And if we can make every school into a, a plastic collection center, it's uh, you know kind of a, a potentially scalable solution to uh, an intractable problem. Super, thank you, Mazin. That's great. Um, Victor, do you want to come in with your with your response, and then we can explore those topics a little bit more. So, in terms of um, how you are financially, uh, you know, supporting your your scheme, um, are you there, Victor? Hello. Hi. Can you hear us? Hello. <laughs> oh yeah, that sounds better. There's a bit of feedback coming. Hello. No, Victor, your microphone seems to be off or... Okay, you've gone back to mute. Okay, so what I'll do while, while Victor's just sorting out his, um, his sound, because I know the internet connection isn't always the easiest, um, just to pick up on, on that conversation then about how, um, how recycling incentive schemes can be funded. Because okay, hello. Oh, hi, you oh, there you are. Now? Excellent. Yes, you can. Loud and clear. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, oh, okay, then. Um, first, okay. I want to say huge, huge salutations to, to every of the entrepreneurs who have spoken so far. Uh, getting funding to to run waste management uh, or incentive scheme is quite very challenging, and it actually takes passion and um, very serious resilience to pull through. For us at Waste Bazaar, what we're able to do is, like I mentioned earlier, we've started up a waste processing facility, which is called Big Food Recyclers which actually processes this collected waste into resin pellets and sells them at premium to manufacturers of footwear soles and synthetic fiber here in Nigeria. So what we were able to do with Waste Bazaar is to scale our collection with it. That means we already have a market for every of the collected recyclables that we're, we're handling. So once we take recyclable waste from, from recycling center operators, recycling station operators from the Waste Bazaar app, we have ready markets for them. And that's where we're able to cover our costs. And like I always say, you give in your all to whatever you're passionate about. So we bootstrapped a lot. There are a lot of fundings. There are no extra funds for chocolate with those at Waste Bazaar. Instead, we put it back into the business to make sure that things go fine. So the whole area of our funding and revenue is that truly we're a social enterprise, scaling social impact, but at the same time, we generate revenue. Uh, what I will quickly want to push in before I give the floor to someone else is that there should be serious work on market research and analysis done by aspiring entrepreneurs in the recycling or incentive, uh, uh, incentive motivated waste recycling platform. You should first ask the question of who of takes these materials, who takes this material from you? Because government over here in Africa don't really care what happens to the waste. And that's why you find a lot of trash on our streets. So for any aspiring entrepreneur, thinking about going into the incentivized motivated recycling programs should first identify, is there a market for this collection? If there are no market for it, what value can you add to this waste that can make it become premium? Like Marvin said, he looked at it as an avenue to make bricks. If people, government is not taking back the, 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 the plastic waste from you, you can step it a, a step further by making bricks. Then you can sell. Because if there's no revenue being generated, there's no sustainability. I think sustainability is called first on people, on planet, and profit. So uh, that's just my little input. I think I can still follow on. And then I can contribute when you call me again, Zoe. That's great. Thanks so much, Victor. That's all really, really, yeah, all perfectly valid points. And you're, you're absolutely right about needing the passion and resilience to set something like this up because it's not, um, it's not going to be an easy ride, is it? And it's, it's never easy making a profit from waste management. So really interested to hear your points there as well about, you know, will people pay for the service of having their waste collected? And if that doesn't cover your costs, then what are you going to do with the materials that you've collected to, you know, to turn it into something valuable 
and make more of a profit. So, um, for example, one of our projects at WasteAid is, you know, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with, but we are collecting LDPE plastic, so the, the plastic bag plastic, um, melting it down, mixing it with sand and turning it into paving tiles, which is very similar to the technology currently being um, trialled in various places of making plastic roads. Um, now, I know it's quite a contentious area. Um, people think that, well, people have um, have their concerns uh, one way or the other. Um, and it's good to see, and um, we've got Professor Linda Godfrey um, here today um, on the, on, in the chat room, um, saying that she is currently doing some extensive research in South Africa on uh, the wet and dry methods to make uh, roads using plastic waste. And um, so for those of you who don't know, it's basically you melt the plastic down um, and use it in as a replacement for some of the bitumen or the tar that you would normally mix with the with the stones to make a road surface. So um, so great to know uh, that Professor Linda Godfrey and her team are working on that in South Africa. Um, she's actually asked if the panelists have considered using uh, you know doing doing this kind of process and um, just before I pass over actually to the panelists and ask them about that I will say there's quite a few people unable to find Victor Amusa's app Waste Bazaar on Google Play Store so I've just gone on to it while we were chatting and it's it's Waste Bazaar is all one word so ditch the space it's just waste and then after the E straight into the B A Z okay so hopefully people can find it there um, so I'm going to ask Mazin actually because you've been you know talking about the the different processes you're thinking of adopting with your plastic waste. I know you've done eco bricks, which where you know they're great in in the sense that they're like no tech and everyone can join in. And when you don't have any outlet for any plastic waste, it's a, a I think it's a sensible way to to control that waste. Um, and and then you've also looked at the precious plastics, which is a bit more quite a bit more high tech, isn't it? It's a, from one extreme to the other in terms of small scale plastic processing. Um, so have you have you looked at all into this? Um, you know, paving tiles, road surfaces, this kind of uh, option, because I know some groups in India are doing it already, aren't there? So Mazin, over to you. Yeah, we recently found out that our city, Gohati, which is pretty remote in India, um, the municipal department has started uh, paving roads with plastic. Uh, so that's another uh, option. Uh, uh, currently, we're, we're using all of the plastic for bricks and, and we need, like, uh, you know, uh, we, we need more of the plastic for the bricks. Uh, but if, uh, or when we expand collection to more schools, we expect there's gonna be kind of a bottleneck in the, the sorting uh, and uh, processing of the plastic. So we're planning on roads and cement factories as just there for the overflow or for any surplus of, of plastic. Uh, especially when we scale up to more schools, we expect where there's going to be a, a mismatch in our uh, 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 processing capacity and the collection capacity. Uh, Ecobricks is uh, really low tech and something we can start in, in schools immediately. So there's already you know, five or six schools that I've heard of that have uh, uh, adopted our kind of model and anyone can just start immediately. Uh, the, our school does, um, so we, we train students to tackle social problems uh, with increasing levels of sophistication as they learn more. Uh, so now our students are ready to start building these, uh, these machines uh, for, for extruding the plastic. But that can be a part of every school's curriculum also. They sh students should learn how to uh, work with machines, how to develop machines. They can invent their own machines. And if uh, we're now in meetings with, uh, you know, the government officials that design curriculums and then uh, uh, policies for schools, we're trying to get into those meetings. If, if this can become, uh, you know, a part of the coursework for, uh, you know, at a district level or state level or national level, then uh, it's really valuable for the kids to learn about sustainability and responsibility. And uh, it can, uh, you know, really help address the problem. Definitely interesting. Okay, thank you. And in terms of just something that you mentioned there at the end um, of, of what you're saying about the, working with the municipalities, because um, someone's, I think, yeah, Professor Linda Godfrey's asked an interesting question here as well in terms of, 
you know, what's your relationship like with the municipal council? Because technically, I mean, waste collection is normally in the remit of the municipality. So has there been any conflict? Have they been very supportive of your scheme? Um, so if we'll start with Mazdan and then we'll work around the group on this one, I think. Um, so in India, there's not much recycling going on. Um, there's hardly any collection going on. And whatever is collected is dumped into um, uh, landfills or water bodies. It's, it's a really big problem. It's destroying uh, uh, protected ecosystems here. Uh, in terms of the recyclable wastes, India's pretty good about, uh, there's kind of a informal economy of uh, what they call rag pickers here, who collect bottles, um, plastic bottles, glass bottles, all the usable stuff that gets collected and, and comes back into the economy somehow. Uh, uh, so there's no issue with that. The main issue that you see everywhere is the, the non-recyclable plastics. Uh, government would like to get involved, but they're very limited. Uh, like, they're, they're, I mean, they're hardly collecting, just collecting the waste. So even talking about recycling is like, uh, you know, kind of a, a crazy idea out here. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, Hilda, how about you? Are you working in partnership effectively with the municipality there in Accra? Have there been any conflicts? Are they supportive of your program? Yes, so actually I'm in a very unique position. Um, I have worked with the government system, like I said, for a decade and a half, um, and uh, most of my work interfaces with uh, the government agencies at the local level and national level. So this has paved the way for all other interventions that I've worked in. And in this particular instance, uh, instance, the because it's a waste is a municipality uh, responsibility, the first part of call is to engage the municipality and or district. We have different rates of um, uh, local government agencies. And um, so in Ghana and in Accra, we started, of course, engaging the municipalities about what we we're going to set up. But what I would say is that personally, I have been involved in behavior change processes, collection, uh, reprocessing, so um, uh, processing the waste. And then we are also looking for life and life solutions. So when we present our, our proposal to the municipality, is a holistic uh, package that we give to the municipality. And um, because of this, we get good reception from the municipality and cooperation. Uh, we've, ha we've not had any problems with them so far. Um, um, and they are happy actually to work with us to scale up what we are doing. Um, other municipalities have seen what we are doing and they are coming to us to um, uh, partner with us. So uh, when it comes to engagement with municipalities, we don't have a problem. Um, you earlier mentioned the end life solutions. We have had um, um, as part of our program to ensure that all the plastics that we collect or the waste that we collect are processed and given end life solution. So they must end up in a, a, a useful material for the community. And uh, we have engaged uh, applications by factories and entities that would use the plastics, for example, to do pavement blocks. Uh, we also to do, like I said, bucket, bowls, and uh, chairs, and other, other plastic materials. Um, we are also, we've engaged, or we were engaged with um, Dow Chemical to um, uh, work with a local road builder to see how we can um, add uh, plastics as additives to uh, make um, roads. And we started the engagement with government um, agencies that are responsible for road construction, this company and Dow to first do the testing of this application in Ghana because it's been done in other countries, but it's not been done in Ghana, the weather and everything. So we sent the first samples to Prague for them to do the testing and uh, the results came, they were not very good 
they are they they've been improved upon so yes we are in engagements with the various stakeholders to see how we can also use plastics as um, additives in uh, uh, road construction because um, we i think dow and other companies have um, in the past used um, uh, natural uh, not natural um, virgin plastics in road application so if it's been done before uh, with virgin plastics i guess we can also use um, uh, waste plastics uh, we 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 got funding recently to uh, consolidate the work we are doing and in as part of the funding we are exploring other end applications like the use of plastics to make um, uh, furniture for schools um, also use it for um, fencing um, other building materials so we have uh, collaborated with about 10 uh, startups and companies or initiatives that are different uh, stages of development and we hope that we will continue this especially now that we have this funding to ensure that they come to that we bring them to scale and they can actually start producing there is no value as one of the, my colleagues mentioned here that there is no value in collecting uh, waste when you cannot put it to good use otherwise it goes back to the environment and the aim of all of us is to ensure that we get rid of the waste and uh, sustainably so that is what we are trying to do that's great thanks so much hilda really interesting i was particularly interested when you talked about how you're collaborating with a number of startups that are making products from the waste materials that you're collecting so great job there in bringing the various partners together you know with your collection system people that are happy to fund you and, and support what you're doing and then also the startups that have the creativity and the, the resilience or whatever the skills to actually try try making products so yeah good luck to you all that sounds really helpful and i for one and i'm sure the other um, listeners would also like to 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 know where we can find out more um so maybe we can add that into the comments at the end um you know if you if you're going to be posting regular updates on your website about your progress i think it would be really helpful to share that with with everybody if you'd be so kind um right finally over to victor on that on that question then um which I've forgotten actually what the question was now. It's also interesting. We're having lots of good in, good questions coming in here as well. Um, Victor, shall I just pass over to you? Yeah, first I want to mention that um, support is not really easy to come by in Nigeria. And um, the reason why I said that is because, have a look at these images. I actually took them yesterday while I was heading home. Now this image shows you that the municipal council themselves are already overwhelmed by the volume of trash that is being generated daily. Now, the skip bin you're seeing is that of the municipal council. So now, imagine where you now offer a solution to this waste management crisis. You, you're celebrated, you have a lot of applause, a round of applause, but that doesn't mean that they're going to put funds in what you do. So we are a social enterprise, really, and at the same time, we are targeted at making sure that we're not just making impact, we're also able to sustain this initiative. And for us, with the municipal council, what we try to do is, as much as we are making impact, we make them understand that there's a gap to be filled. And that gap is to get them committed to drive policies. I have a belief that government has no business in business. All government needs to do is to provide this, the environment, conducive environment, to make entrepreneurship drive, to make it thrive. Now, because as it is, when we work at Waste Bazaar and we reduce the level of street litter and indiscriminate waste disposed in our environment, it helps us in a way to one, create jobs for young people who operate these recycling stations. Now, what we've learned to do is provide the data, make the government and the municipal council understand the impact of what we do. A whole lot of time, what they tell us is there's no fund, there's no fund, the government has no money. And we continually say we don't need the money. 
we need you to drive extended producers' responsibility. Most of the waste you find on the streets have been generated in industrial scale by big companies like Coca-Cola, like PepsiCo, like a couple of other companies who ordinarily should be concerned about where the end of life of their materials goes to. How does it end? So for us at Waste Bazaar, we've come to understand that we can actually reduce urban and peri-urban street littering. We can also reduce emission from waste burning. We try as much as possible also to engage more of our followers on social media. We use the local radio, and then we do physical campaigns through cleanup activities and recycling workshops. Now, this had actually elicited a lot of interest in the, in the teeming youth population. And so far, we've not gotten any funding yet at Waste Bazaar, but we've won several awards with Vic Food Recyclers. We've won grants from Vic Food Recyclers to process the collected waste. So for us at Waste Bazaar, we look at it as more of an opportunity, a win-win situation. And also to know that the municipal council should come to understand that it is goal 17, SDG 17, partnership for goals. And that is how we can scale impact. That we continually press for in our local community. Thank you. That was a superb response, <laughs> very comprehensive and, and spot on, actually. And you picked up on, on a lot of the themes um, that I've got scribbled down on my notepad here. Um, and this has been a really interesting conversation with really, really valuable um, inputs from, from all of the panellists and the people sending in questions as well. Thank you all so much. I've just got to keep an eye on the time because we've only got eight minutes left to go. Um, so unfortunately, there's no way that we're going to be able to get everybody's questions questions answered but what I was thinking was I will go on to LinkedIn straight after this and I'll start up a conversation so if you search for me on LinkedIn and then whoever wants to join in from the panelists and from other questioners and um, we can continue the conversation there and um, so just with uh, with the last you know seven or eight minutes I'd like to just give each of you um you know one last chance to I think maybe what the main you know one of the more the bigger questions that we that we need to look at here is um you know for people that would like to set up their own recycling incentive scheme um in a in a lower income country say from your experience what setbacks did you encounter and how did you overcome them you know what what advice would you give to other people um looking to set up a scheme like this just in two minutes each please so uh, mazin you're first up you go thank you uh, I think it's very difficult uh, in, I, I don't think I've seen anywhere else in the world. I, I'm African. I'm from Sudan. Uh, I, I grew up in the States. Um, I haven't seen anywhere where there's so much acceptance of kind of just discarding the waste where you are. It might be because the, the culture here is more, uh, people are more attuned or more at one with nature. They don't see nature as like a separate thing that you need to conserve um maybe i'm not sure but i've seen uh, the incentive schemes here not work out where they've given onions and um it, it wasn't enough so there needs to be some cultures might have more of a aversion to to the plastic waste and 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 then the incentives can be uh more affordable uh what we've seen is uh nobody wants to sort uh, segregate their plastic waste and send it they think it's kind of stupid. Uh, only when we had strict financial penalties imposed, and that's because we're providing high quality schooling. So the school is, is of such high quality that the parents want to be there. Uh, so again, we can't even replicate that in a government school because nobody wants to go there. So until we make the school into something where the, the parents are happy to, to send their kids, then we can impose uh, these harsh penalties. Uh, and other countries where they've been really successful, like South Korea, uh, you know, very responsible, uh, uh, you know, households are very responsible with their recycling. It's because of financial penalties being imposed by the government. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think there, there needs to be some kind of uh, enforcement from the government. Sure. Okay. Thanks. And that's really, really uh, interesting. I think it's, so what you're saying really is that it's got to be a carrot and a stick. 
you know you've got to uh, like you're saying you've got to have regulations that enforce it on the one end but you also it's about creating that value so i think where the other two schemes are um, are looking more at mo the monetary value you're looking at the the value of that education and that's what you're providing in return for the plastic waste so well good luck um with expanding it out to other schools we'd be really interested in in following that up and seeing how it goes yeah thank you thank you um, right uh, victor how about you do you want to uh, just come in on there what advice would you give to anybody else looking to set up uh, an incentive scheme just in a couple of minutes. Okay, okay. Very, very, the very big problem in waste recycling and incentivized, incentive motivated waste recycling is the problem of logistics. I must tell you that plastics are not heavy, they take a lot of space. So when you are able to wrap your end around solving the problem of logistics, you are able to earn reasonable margin from waste collection or recyclable waste collection. Now, how we were able to do it at Waste Bazaar and Big Food Recyclers was instead of having to go door to door, neighborhood to neighborhood, combing the streets, and at the same time spending so much on logistics, we simply created clusters of collection, which help, help to monitor what volume has been collected in a cluster. So it's like somebody driving a personal car, you have two people in it, and then you're driving or you are riding in a bus. The, 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 the kind of urban mass transit keeps low your costs and your expenses. So what we did was when we have clusters of collection in community, like I mentioned, having local impact across the communities you serve is very key. Now, when you have those collections done in clusters, it brings down your cost of logistics. I also need to also say that every new entrant into the incentive motivated recycling program should do extensive market research into who takes and where does this final thing goes to. Now, I understand a lot of us are passionate, but sometimes when you're passionate and you don't have a well thought out plan or a well highlighted cost structure, there's no sustainability. One final thing I will say, is that one size does not fit all. So the area of innovation is very key. While also looking at the sustainability of the project, different markets respond differently. I think these highlights can help every new entrant into this system. Thank you so much, Victor. Really, really good insights there. I think, yeah, definitely um, one big lesson that we've learned as waste managers um, is that transport can often, you know, the cost of transport can often make or break um, any kind of waste collection scheme. So, yeah, all really good advice there to check out your logistics, make sure you've done your business plan and your market research before you embark on a big, uh, timely uh, initiative. So I can see Sweater's just come back for the last couple of minutes. Hi again, Sweater. Um, We've got time just to pass to Hilda for one last minute of, uh, of your advice, please, Hilda, to other people that might think of setting up an incentive scheme. Hilda, do we have you? Um, yes. Uh, what I would add to, because what all that my colleagues have said is valid and they must take them into consideration. What I will add to it is that we are all driven by passion. The, the, the challenges are enormous, but when you are driven by passion, um, it's like, hey, again, it doesn't matter how much injuries you get. You are just driven by passion. So for us, that is our motivation. You will not see results um, in the immediate midterm uh, uh, future, but you will definitely see results. But you must keep at it. There will be a lot of setbacks, but at the end of the day, you will see the bright light. When you start to see impact, you start to see the street cleaner, the people are exhibiting better behavior, then you know that you are getting somewhere. Um, two, like my colleague from Nigeria said, your, 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 your scheme or your, your operations has to be a well thought through program. Because you are working in a in a deprived situation, structure, nothing available. So you know you are going to change uh, behavior 
because that will drive in the, 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 the waste. And then you must have a way of collecting it. You must have a way of um, um, processing it. You must have a way of transporting it. You must have a way of disposing it safely and sustainably. So when you have a well thought through program, then you know that you are almost through. But when you have have baked cake, I'm sorry, you end up getting frustrated. And I, I must assure, I, I must also add that when people see that you are doing well, yes, the municipalities have issues and all that, and they may frustrate you, but I'm telling you, everybody knows a good thing. And when they see the good thing happening, they will join. It's a matter of time. So let's all keep it. And the new, it's a big cake for. Okay, thank you, Hilda. Um, I think that the uh, the sound quality is a little bit weak at the end there, but really motivating advice from everyone. Um, thank you all. This has been very interesting, very valuable. Um, really appreciate all of you, Mazin, Victor, Hilda. Um, thank you for coming on, giving us your time, even though you're, we know you're very busy doing amazing work. Um, so, and thanks to everyone who's been listening. Joe, Naomi, Dave, um, Nina, Gaboyega. Um, we've had lots of really positive comments, lots of great feedback. So I think that um, maybe LinkedIn is definitely the place for us to continue this conversation. I mean, there are some big areas like um, extended producer responsibility. I know Victor touched on it, but you know, who's, who's, who should really be uh, paying for this kind of thing? Is, is one big question that we haven't even had chance to uh, to touch on properly so and, and there's lots of other questions that have come through like are people collecting organic waste um how do you determine the value of a material that you're going to sell on um what are your considerations around health and safety so this there's lots of questions basically that we've not had time to to cover but i'm sure if i speak for any longer sweaty will start getting annoyed with me so i'm just going to say thank you very much to everybody for joining us i've really enjoyed it i've learned an awful lot and i'm looking forward to continuing the conversation on linkedin see you there this afternoon thanks Hey, uh, thank you, Zoe, and uh, thanks, everyone. This was a very good conversation, and I think it'll be great if you could uh, move the conversation to LinkedIn as well, because I have a few things to add to the conversation, too. So uh, anyway, and everyone, you can find Zoe on LinkedIn. She's going to put up a post and carry the conversation forward. In case you're having troubles finding her, please write to us at connect at wasteprice.de. We will be happy to point you to the right people. We'd be happy to give you the right contacts and the right context for everything. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to all the panelists. Uh, we will catch you. Uh, I mean, just for all the attendees, our next panel is going to be with Adam Reed, and it's already been listed on our website. Please head there, have a look at it, and then you can sign up for it. Bye, folks.